As is customary in this company, we start things one minute early because everybody's here. So now being 11.29, I think we can call get, get going here. Good morning. I would like to ask this meeting to come, please come to order. My name is Ronald Cliff, and I am the, the director and the chairman of the board of Canfor Corporation, and I will be acting as chairman of this meeting. I'm delighted to extend a warm welcome to all of you today for the 29th annual general meeting of Cancer, Canfor Corporation as a public company. At this point, it's with great pleasure I introduce our president and chief executive officer, Mr. Jim Shepherd, who is seated beside me, and will be, I will be calling on Jim to address you later in the meeting. With your indulgence, I propose that any questions you may have be reserved until after you've heard from myself and Jim unless the questions relate to a motion on the floor. Also seated at the head table is David Calabrigo, Vice President, Corporate Development, General Counsel, and Corporate Secretary, and he will be acting as chairman of the meeting today. At this time now, I'd like to introduce to you our directors, Mr. Peter Bentley, please, Mr. Glenn Clark, Mr. Michael Kornberg, Mr. Jim Pattison, Mr. Conrad Panett, Jim Shepard, the President, Max, Max Singleton of Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, and Ross Smith. I, they have all worked very hard this year in, in the difficult year we've had, and, I, and we all appreciate their wise counsel that they've given not only to the board but to the, but to the management. I'm also delighted to introduce Mr. Bill Stinson, Bill, of Vancouver, who's consented to stand for election as a director of the company. It is very appropriate to express my appreciation for the contribution that all the company's personnel have made during this most difficult past year, and to introduce the other officers of the company. And dealing with them alphabetically, Alistair Cook, Vice President, Capital Projects, Mark Feldinger, Vice President, Wood Products Manufacturing. Don Kane, Vice President, Wood Products Marketing. Tom Sitar, Vice President, Finance and Chief Financial Officer. Rob Stewart, Vice President, Human Resources. Doug Wartzler of Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, who is President of our company down there, New South. And Ken Higginbottom, Vice President, Forestry and Environment. Now, as to the scrutineers of this meeting, I appoint CIBC Mellon Trust Company to act as the scrutineer for the meeting, and I would now ask Mr. Calabrigo to deal with the notice of the meeting. Mr. Chairman, the notice calling this meeting was mailed to all shareholders of the company entitled to receive such notice. CIBC Mellon Trust Company has provided us with a certificate of mailing, has the mailing and a copy of the certificate to be checked the records of the meeting. Thank you. And now, while you're warmed up, I'd like to ask you to read the preliminary scrutineer's report. We are pleased to report that there are 95 shareholders representing 111,096,453 shares represented in person or by proxy. This, this represents 77.8% of 142,686,097 issued outstanding shares. Thank you. In accordance with the scrutineer's preliminary report, I declare a quorum present and the meeting duly constituted for the transaction of business. I would also I'd like to ask those who have kindly agreed to move and second motions that need to be made to be kind enough to give their names and to state that they are shareholder or proxy holder. As you all know, there are certain necessary motions that must be made and seconded and voted upon in order to help, in order to help expedite this meeting, some of the shareholders have graciously agreed to make or second these various motions which is no way intended to inhibit any questions or discussions with respect to the motions. The minutes of the last meeting of shareholders are available for perusal by any shareholder. Unless somebody wishes them read, I will entertain a motion to take the minutes as read and to approve them. Good morning. My name is uh, Kevin Pankratz, and I'm a shareholder of the company. I move that the minutes of the annual general meeting of members held on April 29th, 2010, be read and be approved. Thank you, Mr. Pankratz. May I have a seconder? Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Chairman, my name is Sandy Sawing. I'm a shareholder. I, I second the motion. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Sawing. You've heard the motion. All in favor, please signify in the usual manner by raising your hand. 
Contrary, if any, declare the motion carried. The next item of business is to place before the meeting the consolidated financial statements of the company for the year ended December 31st, 19, uh, 2010, together with the auditor's report thereon and the report of the directors to the members. These statements, which uh, are available outside as you entered the room, contain, and the reports are contained in the company's annual report, and they have been mailed to all the shareholders, but as I say, there are extra copies available. Unless there are any questions, I will regard these statements and reports as having been received by the meeting. The next item of business is the election of directors. The meeting is now open for nominations. My name is Renee Villeneuve. I'm a shareholder of the company. I nominate Peter J. G. Bentley, Glenn D. Clark, Ronald L. Cliff, Michael J. Kornberg, James A. Patterson, Conrad A. Panette, J. McNeil Mack Singleton, Ross S. Smith, William W. Stinson as directors of the company to hold office until the next annual general meeting. Thank you, Ms. Villeneuve. The persons nominated are management's nominees for election, as was stated in the information circular mailed to the shareholders of the company. Are there any further nominations? There being no further nominations, I declare nominations closed, and as only the required number of persons have been nominated, I declare that those persons nominated have been duly elected by acclamation as directors of the company and to hold office until the next annual general meeting. The next item of business is the appointment of auditors, and it is the board's recommendation that the present auditors be reappointed. May I have a motion to that effect? Mr. Chairman, my name is Michael Farmer, and I'm a shareholder. I move that Pricewaterhouse Cooper's LLP Charter of Accountants be appointed as auditors for the company to hold office until the next annual general meeting. Thank you, Mr. Kornberg. May I have a seconder? My name is Greg Jung, and I am a shareholder of the company. I second the motion. Thank you, Mr. John. You've heard the motion. All in favor, please signify in the usual manner. Contrary of any, declare the motion carried. Pricewaterhouse Coopers LLP, our chartered accountants, are appointed as auditors. Now we get to the more interesting part. I now call upon Jim Shepard, our president and chief executive officer, for his very valuable remarks concerning our company. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before presenting my concluding remarks, I wish to provide first quarter results. Last night, we reported net income of $32.3 million for the first quarter of 2011, compared to $55.4 million for the fourth quarter of 2010, and $35.5 million for the first quarter of 35.5 for the first quarter of 2010. The company's net income attributable to shareholders for the first quarter of 2011 was $7 million, or $0.05 cents a share, down from $31.4 million, or $0.22 cents a share, for the fourth quarter of 2010. In the first quarter of 2011, a stagnant U.S. housing sector and severe winter weather conditions across much of North America weighed heavily on home construction activity. While the company's lumber production in the current quarter was up 7%, shipments of lumber were down 3%, reflecting the major disruption to transportation networks caused by the adverse weather conditions. For offshore markets, lumber demand remained at high levels and continued to support higher prices for narrow dimensions in North America, with the average 2x4 benchmark up 10% from the previous quarter. However, these price increases were not replicated across wider dimensions in all higher grades. Those are the highlights of the press release issued this morning. Now I will continue with my remarks on 2010 and our projection for the future of this company. As the front cover of our annual report states, we're ready. This is much more than a catchphrase here at Canfor. It is a factual statement of the preparedness of this company's resources and people to respond to the opportunities and challenges that lie ahead. It was not always that way. 
This management team came into place in May 2007. And while prospects weren't good at that time, they were due to get worse, much worse. The ensuing years saw the near collapse of the U.S. housing sector, which at the time took the delivery of almost 80 percent of our lumber volume. And this was followed, as you well know, by the global economic meltdown in late 2008. Fortunately, under Don Kane's leadership, our marketing department had been working on the development of the market in China. This effort was energized and widely expanded by the focus program of the BC Forestry Missions to China, to China, initiated by a provincial government and led by then Forestry Minister Pat Bell. The net result is that we have seen the China market share rise from less than 1% to nearly 30% of all our Canadian SPF production in just four years. This expansion of our marketplace came at a critical time and has contributed to a much needed diversification away from our over dependency on the U.S. housing sector. In fact, the U.S. share of our shipments has now been reduced from 80 percent to less than 50 percent. It should be emphasized, however, that, Can that Canfor remains committed to being a sustainable provider of lumber products to its vital strategic customers in the home center, pro-dealer, and Japanese markets. This preparation over the past four years, together with the strong performance of our pulp business, has helped us to scratch our way back up to report four consecutive profitable quarters in 2010 for the first time since 2006. While a year of profits is most welcome to report we still have work to do to deliver the returns our shareholders expect and deserve. The rejuvenation work started back in 2007 and continues with increasing energy and purpose. The past year saw investments of $88 million in our lumber mills, most of it in modernization that takes advantage of state-of-the-art technology to reduce our cost and improve the quality of our lumber products. Looking forward, we plan to invest an additional $300 million in further mill modernization, which when combined with the CAN4 operating system, which is our in-house customization of the Lean Sigma process, which is focused on the elimination of waste, this will place our operations in the top tier of our industry. While it is difficult to predict the future, it is becoming apparent that the long, painful condition of an oversupply of Canadian lumber serving a finite U.S. market is transforming into a more attractive balance that will see our lumber serving a much wider marketplace that encompasses the new markets of Asia, especially China, along with the traditionally important and vital markets of Canada, the United States, and Japan. The efforts of our marketing thrust in China are addressing the demand picture, but what about the supply side of the equation? Well. The reduction in the annual allowable cut in Ontario and Quebec, and now beginning in British Columbia, is shrinking the fiber basket of Canada. The net result is that Canadian SPF lumber will be drawn from a limited supply to serve a growing demand in an expanded international market. This shift from an additional oversupply condition to a much more favorable over-demand condition projects a bright future for Canfor and its shareholders. Although Canadian SPF Lumber presently holds the lion's share of our lumber revenue, our New South Yellow Pine Lumber business is an important beachhead for us in the southern U.S. market. There too, we have been making strategic investments in our mills to improve our cost competitiveness and quality outturn. On the labor front, I am pleased to report that we have successfully concluded labor agreements throughout British Columbia and Alberta that provide certainty as well as a bonus for profitability. With these groundbreaking agreements, we now have both our hourly and our salary people with profit incentives teamed together to deliver higher levels of performance. This should lead to improving returns for our shareholders. Finally. This will be my fourth and last address to you shareholders. It has been four challenging but most rewarding years. It has given me an opportunity to make a small contribution 
to a terrific company that is driven by very fine and capable people. It's been an honor to be associated with them. I must also express a huge thank you to our valuable customers who have been most understanding as we struggle to overcome the many challenges brought on by the mountain pine beetle infestation and the needed mill curtailments that we had to take in order to survive. We remain committed to the on-time and on-tally delivery of quality lumber to all of our strategic customers. It has been a real pleasure to spend this time at Canfor, and I'm pleased to be able to say with conviction that this company will surely prosper under the very able direction of the incoming CEO, Don Kane, and the current management team who have performed so admirably over the past few difficult years. They are all top-notch performers, and this company is in very capable hands. I'd like to express my appreciation to the Board of Directors for their support, advice, and opportunity to serve at Canfor at such an interesting time. And finally, let me say to you, fellow shareholders, thank you for your patience and support. I am certain that with the preparations underway, the incoming management team will deliver the returns you so richly deserve. Like I said at the outlet, Canfor is ready. Before asking for any questions from our shareholders, I would like to say a few words on the subject of our outgoing president and CEO, Jim Shepard. I refer back four years to the time, at the time of our 2007 annual general meeting of Canfor. It had been a difficult time, not only with the lumber markets, but also with key management, with a key management situation and some new member of, and some new members of the board of directors. Our former president and CEO, Jim Shepard, with an E, not an A, now known as Shepard One, had left Canfor. We were very fortunate to recruit an interim president and CEO from the ranks of successfully retired executives. Jim Shepard, i.e. Shepard Two, arrived in the midst of our problems. His background as the head of Finning, Finning Incorporated taught him, amongst other things, the traits of how to sell to the lumber industry. Now his challenge was how to buy equipment and to manufacture and sell lumber. To say that the challenge was far greater than he may have considered at, the, at a given, when it was given. However, he tackled it aggressively and shortly thereafter became the official president and CEO of Canfor. For four years, he has used his skills in leading an outstanding team of senior management through our most difficult times in history. And today, Jim is retiring again from this position with all the best wishes from the board and thanks and our thanks for a remarkable job. We trust that his second retirement will lead to many years of happiness. At the board meeting following this annual general meeting, Don Kane will be elected to the new president as the new president and CEO of Canfor. He achieves this position after 32 years of service to the company, and the board looks forward to the great success under his leadership. Now is the time if anybody wishes to ask any questions, please do so. Please come to the microphone and state your name and whether you're a shareholder or a proxy holder, and we will, I will attempt all the difficult questions and Jim can handle the easy ones. Please. No, my name is Hubert Bunce, and I'm a shareholder, if you're a friend there. Um, several things I would like to say, if I may. I was most impressed, which is not a question, but a comment, that the board had attended 100% of the meetings they were required to attend. I thought that was just there. every board meeting was fully attended. I thought that was quite impressive. Secondly, I um, have a question about the Canfor history. Now, two or three years ago, I asked a question if Canfor was proposing to write a history. And I was told, well, no, maybe not. It was a private history of the Canfor, of the family, the Bentley family, but not of the Canfor. Now, I heard recently a rumor that in the desert in the States somewhere, a history was being written. And I was interested to know if this is a true rumor or if Canfor is going to have a history written. That's my question. 
Um, I would like to answer that question and say that's a possibility. <laughs> well, I think maybe there's a gentleman here who could make it more than a possibility. I'd really it's like a strong it. possibility. It's strong. <laughs> but it is being worked on. Yes, no, definitely. And I expect, uh, we hope that there will be something uh, in the fall of this year will well, be very available. Good. Very good. Look forward to that. Thank you. Um, then I had another comment from my friend here on the uh, bark beetle situation. I understood it went over the Rockies and got into Alberta. Now, Alberta has lodgepole pine and jack pine. Now, is it going into the jack pine or is it, is it dying out there? And has the winter condition set it back? Uh, I know the winter conditions were bad up north, but not bad enough, let's put oh, it that way, way, to deal with the beetle. But maybe you want to comment about Alberta? The mountain pine beetle has arrived in Alberta. Yeah. Uh, it has not had the devastating effect that it's had in British Columbia yet for a couple of reasons. Number one, they're still getting the cold weather, which what we need to, to keep the, uh, to abate the, the, uh, the spread of the, of the beetle itself. But uh, secondly, the Alberta government has been much more proactive, oh. much, much more proactive in, in dealing with any, any hint of any invest, investigation um, compared to what we did in British Columbia. They, they looked at the British Columbia and they learned from our experience, and they're much more aggressive. And consequently, it probably won't be as, as, uh, as, as debilitating as it was in British Columbia. And how about the, the move into the jack pine from the large pine? Are you familiar with that? And maybe not. Or can't, can't. <laughs> Recently it has been reported that Mount Pine people have successfully attacked and killed uh, Jack Pine in Alberta. That's not too big of a surprise that if the two species are kissing cousins, they will hybridize and, and so forth so they're very similar. The, the likely spread east through Jack Pine stands, uh, there are different views about what may happen there as you get into the boreal forest, of course the forest includes a number of other species like trembling aspen and white spruce, and so the concentration of jack pine is not as great as the concentration of waterfall pine in, in the Rockies and in the interior of the sea. So how much does Canfor depend on jack pine as a species with supply? Maybe not that much. In our forest All right, so it's not too significant. No. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Sir. Thank you. I'm Michael Wilson. I'm an environmental scientist, and I'm also a shareholder in this company and, and proud to be one. Um, I have a couple of related questions, actually, that are sort of forward-looking. Reading the annual report and the statement that we're ready uh, I noticed the, uh, the strong statement in terms of Asian markets. I have some familiarity in working in Asia myself, um, in China and Japan. And looking at the composition of the board, I notice uh, an interesting lack of diversity. Um, a lot of people who look like me, and I know the problems I have in working with Asia. Um, what I'm wondering about is the extent to which the board itself is familiar with, first of all, the, uh, the markets in Asia, the vulnerability of those markets, the difficulties of dealing with all these sorts of things. And the reason I ask this is for reassurance, because the, the actual biographies of, the, of the, chair, the, the board members contain not a single word about Asia. And so I'm a little disturbed that there's a bit of a disconnect there. So that's a forward type question. Um, the other question that I have is that, in dealing with environmental change, I think we all realize global change is a reality. And the mountain pine beetle issue is part of a bigger issue of milder winters, for example, coming from global change. Uh, we're also seeing, on a world basis, dramatic increases in urbanization. We're seeing uh, increased vulnerability to environmental disasters. And in fact, the company uh, does benefit from time to time from remediation of natural disasters, whether it's the rebuilding of New Orleans or the rebuilding of Japan. I don't see in these reports a statement that you have some sort of a vision about global change as part of your forward-looking strategy, uh, whether there's a committee 
um, whether the directors have uh, expertise or familiarity with the general issues of global change. And I realize as managers you call upon the right people. So what I'm really doing is asking for some reassurance and some indication of vision in those directions. I think it's there, but it's not in the reports. Thank you. Well, thank you. I'm trying to deal first with your question about China. Um, the board relies upon, to a great extent, to Don Kane, who has been our sales manager for many, many years. And he gives us, at every board meeting, detailed uh, remarks about what's going on in China and the extent that we've been successful there and what he has been done as an individual representing not only our company but the BC forest industry in China. So we, and with the pluses and the minuses, as you, as you mentioned, I think we're, we're pretty well informed as a board to what is going on in China. As to the environmental question, um, I think that the, again, we have people in the company. You saw the report that came out, the separate report that came out. Uh, I take the people who were responsible for that report are here in the room. They take your comments and they will pay attention to your comments. But if, if they're not there now, hopefully they will be, still be paying attention to them. You want to add to that? If I could just add, in the introduction of the election, or of the officers, we could have, and certainly should have, introduced Mako Lu here, who's our Can4 China president and president of the audience today. Oh, yeah. He is the man who is the expert on China. Thank you. Any other questions? If there are no other questions, I would uh, entertain a motion to conclude the meeting. My name is Carolyn Willick. I'm a shareholder of the company, and I move that this meeting be concluded. Thank you, Ms. Willick. Is there a seconder? My name is Edith Chen. I'm a shareholder of the company. I second the motion. Thank you, Ms. Chen. All those in favor, please signify with your right hand. Contrary? To carry a motion carried, and the meeting is terminated. It's closed. Thank you very much for your attendance. Thirty minutes, not bad. Well, Mr. Chairman, it's been fun. <laughs>